Today we're discussing the premiere to the seventh season of Outlander, A Life Well Lost. For those unfamiliar, the Stars series is a time-traveling historical fiction romance that mainly takes place during the American Revolution and stars Sam Hogan and Katrina Bolf. On this podcast, we're going to review the characters, the production, the plot, some trivia, and give our rating. Welcome to another edition of today's episode. So back in the day, I used to like to find pilots and just watch them and and use that as my litmus test as to whether or not I was just going to check out the series. I would never look at the reviews first, right? Mm -hmm. Because that would always ruin it for me. So I remember checking out Outlander a really long time ago. And I remember it was about a woman who wasn't from modern times, but she was from like the, I think, World War II-ish I think it's era? 1945 or around Okay, there. all right. Yeah. And then she finds herself like jumping into the past, even though she's engaged to some guy in the, in the future, in the 1945 storyline. And she falls in love with this other guy in the past. And there's this big love triangle. But now jumping into season seven, uh, it's just her and Jamie. It's just Claire and Jamie. Yep. That other guy, the guy she was originally engaged to, he, something else must have happened to him because he's no longer in the show. Yeah, well, it's been them. They've been the main couple sure. since the beginning. I've seen the posters, so I kind of gathered that was the case, like that they got together fairly early on, and the last few seasons have just been different ways to keep them together. However, it brings me back to when we did the Vampire Academy show because I think the showrunner in that says... The biggest draw for a love story or a romance is keeping the two characters apart. Mm -hmm. That's what causes the uh, drama. That's what causes the intensity, the story, the intrigue. And so the only way that they were going to be able to have a successful show run this long is if they had some weird stuff going on that they tried to tailor make to make the show successful. From what I understand, the season season six finale ended with so many different cliffhangers. Part of that was on purpose, but also part of that was because COVID and scheduling conflicts because the two main actors became so big that scheduling became a real issue for it. So it's like... Katrina Balfe and Sam Hogan? What else have they been in? Because I don't really recognize them except for this. Well, it's yeah, you say that because Sam Hogan actually, way back in the day, auditioned for Casino Royale. I thought you were going to tell me he auditioned for Sons of Anarchy because he could play like a Jax type character. In that well, thing. he was he was auditioning for James Bond, mm-hmm. and not only that, and I he know would have been like twenty five when he did that. I was going to say like late twenties, yeah. but he also was King John. He's like only forty three now. King John play. They yeah. do age him up a bit though. Actually, both of them were in the Dark Crystal, the Jim Henson thing. Oh wow! Yeah. She was mostly in it. I think for like most of the episodes, he I think for only like two or. So, but yeah, their schedules have just gone absolutely crazy. My point is that it's admirable that the TV show has been able to last so long because seven seasons of a romance can get pretty long in tooth if you're not having creative, like... Well, you know how who the creator of this is, I do, right? I do, because I recognized his name, so I immediately looked it up, and then I was like, oh, for all mankind. So he's, so he's What's obviously his name? He, Ronald D. Moore. Yes. He's done a lot of these shows that have taken, like, years just to make one season have been on and, like, long-running Battlestar Galactica as well. But For All Mankind is a perfect example example because the main characters in that uh their relationships fall apart really quickly between season one two and three it's just like with this though they have to keep these two together so what do they do they mix in science fiction they do time jumps not just like time travel jumps but time jumps for the characters themselves they've aged them up a lot um and then they've also done the biggest trope of all which is separating the characters and then reunifying them later on and that's kind of where we start this episode at because at the end of season six from what you can get in the previously and just from indicators in this episode claire has been accused of murdering this uh, lady named malva Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, that's what has torn her away from uh, jamie and now she is in a women's uh prison jail setup and she's going to be tried for murder eventually like an 18th century orange is the new black um not exactly it's more just like a converted uh, i think they called it a slaughterhouse that had been converted into a jail and everybody there there's like i don't know eight nine women um they've all been there forever because trials just aren't happening the judges aren't hearing anything because it's the middle of the american revolution and things are getting bad for the british so there really isn't a government to try them at this point which is ironic because the first scene of the show is her hanging from the gallows 
or about to be uh, hanged from the gallows. That was actually a parallel to season one that almost happened to Jamie, I think, at the very end of the season, and it was like almost shot for shot. It reminded me of Great Expectations, where we see the main character about to commit suicide in the first scene, but that actually came back to play later. With this, it seemed like it was kind of just a dream uh, that Jamie might have, or a fear that Jamie was having at that moment, where well, he was just envisioning his wife about to die. Oh, okay. Because he immediately heads off towards towards where his wife is being held with his uh, right-hand man, who is his nephew, named um, Ian, I think, right? Yeah. And it's young Ian. That's how it's shown. So I assume that there's an old Ian that we've seen in, like, a future storyline, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I mean, you can and... give me a plot points. I'm not going to watch the rest of the show. Um, but you told me it's not the final season, right? Yeah, no. They're actually going to be making a 10-episode season 8. And also, this season is going to be split into two eight parts. So there's actually going to be 16 episodes for this wow. season. So they have a lot more plot to cover. At least 25 episodes. By the time, by the time that Jamie makes his way to the uh, jail, he finds out that his wife has been taken to a ship and that she is actually taking care of a pregnant woman on that ship. Wow, it's interesting you say that because there was so much like talk, mm -hmm. especially after at the end of season six. Yeah. When Claire, in the book, she's moved to New Bern, but in here she was moved to Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And people were saying that because of that change and because of Wendigo Donor, who is a man I think that was introduced. When, Wendigo Donner and he shows up in a different storyline the side storyline that's going yeah, on. Yeah I think he was introduced last season he stole some type of emerald necklace from Flora a McDonald. Gem. Yeah yes. a gem or something like that and people were saying how because of that shift and because of them now possibly meeting together that might actually diverge from the books but you're saying that after Wilmington she was just moved like that well, she's out she, there. She was in a jail in, in Wilmington I guess and then they take her on the ship which is right outside of Wilmington Okay. And they're saying that they're going to take this voyage uh, maybe back to England. But the thing is that she's now the midwife to this uh, Elizabeth Martin, who is the wife to Governor Martin, who is the person who's leading the ship and also kind of in charge of a lot of what's going on in the war, I guess. And so Jamie, once he makes his way to Wilmington and he sees his wife isn't there, uh, Tom um, Christie tells him that uh, she was taken while he wasn't around and that she's uh, she, and that he doesn't know where she is. But later on, he finds out via letter that she's She's at the ship. He tells Jamie, go find your wife. She's in the ship. He goes to the ship. <laughs> I'm saying ship way too much, but he sees his wife. They reunite for a second. And then he goes to like, I don't know, bribe slash talk to the governor guy and say, hey, can you give me my wife back? And the guy at that point had talked to kind of a villain of the series named uh, Douglas Mc McDonald or something or Donald McDonald. Yeah. Donald uh, McDonald. Okay. Donald so McDonald. that's probably who Flora McDonald is married to in the show. Uh huh. Prob probably, but I don't think we meet a Flora McDonald in this episode. So Donald McDonald kind of screws over um, Claire by telling the governor that she is um, wanted for murder, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's when the governor is like, your wife is staying here for now. And if you want to have her back, if you want me to release her or pardon her, then you're going to have to get uh, 200 men to come fight for the Redcoats. Okay, right? so this is this is very interesting because uh -huh. like you're saying, it's saying up for the Revolutionary War and really... It's setting up. I think they've they're at it. Well, at what the point, executive right? producer was uh, talking about, like the main one, they were saying that this episode and really the first few episodes of season seven are supposed to be kind of the calm before the storm. Really? Because they've already talked about losing forts and such. So I, I thought it was like, and they've talked about the rebels and it seems like the armies are already kind of accrued. And... From my understanding, what they're doing is they are taking for this season books six, seven, and eight. And there have been nine books that have been written. There's uh -huh. a tenth one I think that is coming out next year. Yep. But they took a lot of book six for season season six and i think that this episode was supposed to be kind of the remainder of uh, book six and then book seven and eight which really deal on the war aspect are more to come okay so we will see more action i guess yes right? Jamie has to accept the deal for the 200 men, so he leaves the ship, but then makes a plan to come back later that night and, I guess, like, kill everybody that he needs to to get his wife back. Uh -huh. But that's when Thomas comes over, and he's like, Thomas's daughter is the one that um, Claire is accused of killing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. No, okay, so so Thomas actually was, like, uh, I don't want to say, like, chaperoning uh, Claire to Wilmington to have her trial. Uh, to make sure that it was a fair trial because he kind of loves her 
which is a weird relationship to have. And apparently he thought that his daughter was evil or a witch. In fact, he was pretty sure that his daughter, Malva, had tried to murder Claire and Thomas at one point because she loved Jamie and she was jealous of Claire for Jamie. You're saying that Thomas so, loves Claire. So it's just Thomas, like... I don't know if it's a fatherly love or if it's like he's... I don't think he was lusting after her, but he definitely had high respect for both Jamie and Claire. And so he gets drunk and then he like makes an agreement with himself that he... He will turn himself in for the murder of Malva, even though it's pretty clear he didn't actually do it. Mm -hmm. But he does have a very touching scene with Claire where he admits to why he would have killed her if he did kill her. Um, and, and then he asked to be taken away and she is set free. Now, it's a little strange why she would be set free because still she is the only midwife in the county area. And there is this pregnant lady who's been sick and vomiting. And it seemed like the governor was hell bent on keeping her on the ship. Just so the idea she, that was it because she was the only you're saying she's the only midwife. So she's the only one to really know how to deal with this stuff. Yes, that's why she was taken from jail to begin with was that they came in there and they're like, we hear there's a healer in here. And then the only person who raised their hand was Claire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so she gets set free at the end of the episode. And that's when Jamie goes and finds this other big bad in the series named Mr. Brown. And he confronts him in a hotel room and he just murders the guy. He kills him just straight up. I think so, because it's left not 100% that he kills him. He's just going after him, and he's talking about why he's about to kill him, and, and we just don't know if that's what he actually ends up doing. But uh, Mr. Brown, I think, has been, like, the main big bad for at least a season now. Uh -huh. um, he was even mentioned with Wendigo Donner, because Wendigo Donner was originally part of his crew, but when they had killed, I guess, Bree's mom... Um, who Brie I'll get to in a second. Right. But uh, but that's when, when Digo, I don't know, had a change of heart or maybe... I, I, I'm not exactly sure. But, but the strange thing to me was the side storyline in general. Because from what I remember, Claire was the only time traveler. And that's not what ends up being <laughs> right. the case. Because season six, Brie and Roger's like, impending journey back to the future, that was the cliffhanger yeah, so for that show. Remember what I just said. The show needed to find a way to keep a love story alive. So what they did, mm -hmm. they did in this episode was they separated the two love stars and then they reunified them by the end of the episode. Yes. But they also, I guess, introduced another love couple. And that's Roger and Brie, like you just talked about. But not knowing anything about these characters, when Roger was first introduced as just this guy who's trying to become a minister, and he starts doing this speech in front of these these uh, or these conscripted um, people who are going to go join the army or whatever, he says, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And so immediately, <laughs> I know this guy is not from the past, right? Or yeah. not from 19 or 1775, right? He's from uh, even past 1945. Yeah. So it's not like his the Claire timeline even stacks up with his timeline. So, th so that actually is interesting you say that because I did watch the first 10 minutes of the season six finale. Yeah. And although most of that was just action because that was when I believe the police were about to take Claire away for murdering um, whoever she did, the first couple minutes minutes actually showed hamburgers being served at a restaurant mm -hmm. almost like it was like the 50s and 60s reminded me a little bit of Riverdale so yeah I think within the time frame of when the show actually took place back in 1945 in the first episode it's now like you're saying past that so it's not it's not like any time period can come back. Like, there's not going to be some millennial who's just, like, jumping back to the past <laughs> at some point. I don't think so. Brie also is from the future, too, because she makes a mention of Steve McQueen. She's like, you're not Steve McQueen from The Great Escape. So I, when I started hearing different people talk about the future, I was a little confused. But I guess they all know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Brie and Roger storyline is just to supplement the uh, bigger love story between Claire and Jamie. Now, Jamie uh, is the only one who seems to be from where he is. You know? Like, yeah, right. And obviously. I don't even know if Thomas, the guy who the name, the episode name is named after, A Life Well Lost, because he's giving up his life for uh, Claire to be saved, uh -huh. um, if he knows about this whole future thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you want me to get into... I don't have pros and cons in this. I have surprises. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. First of all, less sex than I expected. This isn't dangerous liaisons. Yes. And I was surprised because, again, this is supposed to be a huge romance. I was actually very happy with it because I was like, oh, I don't have to watch two people making out for 40 minutes here. The first kiss happens 35 minutes in and they're immediately scolded for it. The guy's like, you're not allowed to kiss her right now. <laughs> yes. No, I actually agree with you on that because yeah. I watched the first 10 minutes of the season six, six finale and it was just straight up killing. It was an action packed. Oh, we like, didn't get any killing. Minutes, yeah. But there was also... A, 
it's 40 percent audience men actually watched this which is a surprising number because a lot like, of people like, high yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, surprisingly because, high? because especially for like a romantic uh you know period piece i think they've tried to like convert it into an epic of sorts <laughs> like it may have started off even like i don't know they, they definitely toned down that part of it especially as they've aged the characters mm -hmm. up um there's less cosplayness to it. I, it they're using real horses the ships the towns the caverns it almost reminded me a little bit of like the witcher mm -hmm. series yeah um and so like they're definitely spending a budget on this thing I, I was still confused with young ian the fact that there could be an old ian makes me think like does claire there's no way that old Ian would be alive in Claire's original timeline. So they must have jumped to different time periods at some point in the series. Um, also, the, the the love triangle I was talking about, like I was surprised that that guy wasn't part of it, the original uh, husband that she was going to have. The intro song to me, which is called the Sky Boat Song, yes. got stuck in my head. It's like a haunting You're not, melody. You are not the only one. People say that, especially like after they've watched it so many times. I know I that go back and listen to it, for yeah. a little bit, it was like Sinead O'Connor who did like music for it, Barry Bear McCreary, who has done a Bear lot McCreary, of... Bear McCreary, that name is perfect for this type composer. of show. <laughs> yeah, he's been the composer for the series. He's also gotten critical acclaim for mm -hmm. it. Just kind of with, with, you're talking about the real horses, ships, towns, and caverns. Uh, so they use a lot of props for this show, kind of like you were saying. Yeah, yeah. One thing I found interesting was all meals, however, whenever anyone is eating in this show are real. They never ever decided to make any fake meals, which was just the weirdest fact to learn about. She's also like when uh, Claire is taking care of the pregnant woman, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, the pregnant woman's like, I've been taking all these tonics. I don't know why I'm feeling ill. And it's clearly because of the, all the tonics that she's taking. And Claire cre uh, makes some like ginger water for her or something. She also makes a list of stuff to to uh, to get back at Wilmington. And uh, that's how she can contacts her husband. But one of the things she writes down is like, um, what is it? It's like oil of porcupine and it was like these things back then that must have existed and that were sold by like snake oil salesmen it, it's just weird that i guess she must have been a doctor in the future timeline because she knows about stuff like she knew how to perform a c-section and how that is considered either like a witch or like a murderess because she was it's 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 a it's a fun show we don't get a ton of lore in this episode but we do hear about the gemstones and that you have to travel through the stones it would be cool to concentrate a little bit more on what exactly the science is behind that. Could we go to the future and like bring an army through? What's the butterfly effect uh, in this universe? Um, and and uh, yeah, there's just stuff that I would know if I had seen all these seasons. So I can't blame the show for it. Donald McDonald Donald was a crazy name to hear. And then um, we never really understand because the the storyline with Roger and Bree. Roger wants to help Wendigo escape because when Wendigo hears him say "float like a butterfly, sting like a bee," he's like. Ali, like Muhammad <laughs> Ali. Okay. So yeah, because um, um, Wendigo's from the future as well. Okay, and yeah. so when when uh, Roger finds that out, he's like, I'll help you escape. And then he goes to talk to his wife, Bree. Bree doesn't want to help because she knows that Wendigo was part of the crew that killed her mom, right? Uh -huh. And so she says, don't do that. And then Roger, they, they, they like come to an agreement that he'll just pray for Wendigo. So when Digo is just screwed. Yeah, it was so a, that the, sounds the like the storyline with Claire and how she comes back to her husband, like the pregnant wife might be screwed and then also um it, it <laughs> When Digo is definitely screwed. So it didn't feel like there was that much of a conclusion for some of the storylines that were going on in this episode besides the love triangle See, or the that, love stuff. I'm just so surprised to hear that because I thought that book six, or at least from what I learned about this episode, a lot of it was supposed to tie up loose ends that were introduced last season and more specifically last season finale. I think that was more to do with killing off uh, Mr. Brown at mm. the end. Like, we're going to kill off the big... So there's this scene where um, Jamie is walking through the town, and he locks eyes with this horse, and it's a beautiful horse. And I'm <laughs> thinking in my head, if this is Red Dead Redemption, this is the part where he's about to steal that horse. Because that's where you're like, oh man, <laughs> yeah. that would be my horse. But really, he just recognizes it as being Mr. Brown's, and that's why later on... So that's on, how he knows. <laughs> yeah, that's how he but, knows. but when you don't know what's going on, <laughs> I'm just like, why is he making eyes at this horse? What's about to happen? I, I have right. a tr uh, true or false game before yeah, you go get your rating. So again, these are uh, five facts I want us, and you just have to guess true or false. Uh -huh. First one is, after season six, there was talk of possibly ending the entire series with season seven, which would only consist of two more episodes. Okay. 
And then uh, oh, do you want me yeah, to answer yeah, that? Answer. I, that sounds like a true fact. Yes, it is actually. And okay. uh, I know that Kate, uh, Katrina Balf even said that she was not a fan of that idea from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how they're going to be doing like over two more seasons of this series. Right? That's when they were going to, when they were thinking about ending it. it. Just that kind of shocked me. I know there must have been like a huge time jump, and I think that the characters aged like twenty years <laughs> in the in the course of the seven. Because if you go back to the the first episode, their 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 hairs have almost. Switched. Which, like her hair is now shorter where his hair used to be shorter and now his hair is longer and like they just both look like old older people than than they did originally mm -hmm. yeah. okay and then the second one is the show is credited uh with scotland having massive tourism increase ever since the show aired in 2014 really scotland like as a whole well to her false oh i mean that's too big to be i would have to say false even though i would say maybe some towns in scotland it's true scotland, so all of scotland, scotland has had a massive tourism increase. then why would they ever want to cancel the show have scotland be the one who's just like self-supporting this thing make their own <laughs> streaming network when stars goes away it's also strange that scotland is doing an american history show right well like, not only that i mean a lot of people had to learn how to do an american accent sophie skelton and many played, don't right? many just stick with their regular accent Accent. Sophie Skelton, who played Brianna Fraser, she learned. That's Brie. How... Yeah, Brie. She... So, so Brianna Fraser. So she's related to. That makes sense to Claire. She's probably like her sister or something. Um, the one who's marrying Roger. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just gonna say that the actress she learned how to uh, do an American accent off of watching Friends. She had also the most interesting audition backstory. Apparently, she auditioned way back in the show's first season uh -huh. in 2014, yeah. and it took over a year before they called her back. Okay, this reminds me a little bit of Grey's Anatomy. It's like once the original cast started losing steam, what did they do? They brought in Grey's sister to come mm -hmm. play a, a doctor. In this, it was like once the show had that love couple uh, perm permanent with uh, Jamie and uh, Claire, they were like, how can we bring in more f younger family? And that's where they brought in Bree and Roger. Roger, Roger, I would love to know what their backstories were. At some point, I will go to the Wikipedia page and catch up on all of it. But this episode as a whole, I will give it an average grade of a 5 out of 10. That's not to say that it's like a F, like a 50%. That's more to say that it's... It, there are those giant plot holes of like, why did they just let Claire free? What happened to Wendigo? Because apparently like Roger's not going to help him out. And those were the two sole like components of, of the main part of the episode. I but it thought was that yeah, when, I, when I read about Wendigo Donner, I thought that he was a villain. I don't know why. He, is, he is a villain to Bree. She doesn't mm -hmm. want to help him, but you can see why. Like, he originally came back, apparently, to help the Indians. The Indian Americans? Huh. I, yeah, I don't know. But, like, he, he kind of got stuck on the wrong side of things to try to survive. And even Roger makes, like, a full uh, speech about how he had to do the same thing. He watched, like, a woman have her baby tossed off a, a ship, and she jumped off after it. <laughs> when you, she was part of Benton's crew or something. You gave it a 5. The overall show is an 8.4, but yeah. uh, the episode has a 9.2. Okay. And actually, Thomas. Season... Thomas's confession is probably the reason why. Season 7 has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. The rap said that Outlander Season 7, it feels like a breath of fresh air because they felt like the show had kind of been losing steam, like you were talking about. Uh, the quality was worsening ever since, really, I think, a couple seasons back. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, really, I think what the showrunners are trying to do this season is just kind of make up, I think, for past mistakes. Because mm -hmm. I think that the audience has felt the same way. And the reason I believe that is because season seven only has a 67%. Mm -hmm. And that, and it's only been one episode so far. That's what the audience score is? Yeah, the audience score. Interesting. I, again, I don't doubt that people who have enjoyed the show up until now are going to love this season. Because there were things to definitely enjoy about it, which I think we've covered. Um, it's just that for anybody I would be recommending this to, I would say it's a very average average show overall. Because uh, you're, you know what you're getting into and you know sort of what the plot points will be uh is there anything else you want to say oh the true false game the last three mm -hmm. okay so the episode's title a life well lost is a quote from william shakespeare's play as you like it uh i, I don't know that play so i don't know <laughs> uh false well, <laughs> as you like it is the name of a play but yes it's false it's actually from the diana galbaldin's books the the series oh, okay uh, the last one is the show was inspired by doctor who it it was a little bit like Doctor Who, but it no, I will I will say say false to that. Uh, actually, no, it was specifically true. The character Jamie oh, cool. McMurrin from the '60s, that character actually really did inspire the television show. So that was that was true. So it wasn't the new Doctor Who; it was when it was like oh, very old. Okay, I yeah. got you. Yeah. The final one: the same people who worked on the Gilded Age costuming department helped with this series. So I'm just gonna say location-wise, false. 
Yes, it is false. Okay. But apparently the costume department for this show was so massive that they had an inventory system with barcodes to keep track of everything just because of how many costumes and like wigs and everything that they actually ended up having. Wow. All right. Good research. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye.